The voice of Husker Nation is on the air. This is Hale Varsity Radio. Insight, opinion, expertise, along with the biggest names talking Nebraska sports. Join in with the show at 402-489-1240 or 1-800-825-5865. Now, here are your hosts, Chris Schmidt and Elijah Herbel. Welcome to it. Great to be with you on a Friday at Tail Bar City Radio. We're presented by Currency for all your equipment financing needs. Go Currency. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbel. And you can dial us up at 489-1240. Send some emails, if you like, at chris at hailvarsity.com. And as always, uh, comment, contribute on the stream. Ways to do that, watch the show on the Hale Varsity YouTube channel or the Hale Varsity Radio Twitter feed at H Varsity Radio. Busy show. We'll spend time with Jacob Padilla from Hale Varsity in about 15 minutes. Different... Uh, set up with Jacob. We usually get video with Jacob. He is all over the basketball courts today. So we'll talk some summer basketball with Jacob, get his thoughts on some Husker football with the schedule release and uh, some really nice prep prospects. He's having a chance to observe and uh, more offers coming out uh, for kids around the, the metro region. So Jacob in about Uh, 15 minutes or so in hour two loaded up bill dolman gonna join us from parts unknown bill needs a cnn crew following him uh like we've seen with a couple of different celebrities stanley tucci comes to mind and bill's not in italy but bill's we'll figure out where bill's at last week he was on a bridge in tampa bay So apparently it's it's some notable bridge. I can't remember the name of it anymore. He gave us the name. It was a really impressive looking bridge, but that was last week. I am curious to see where he is this week. It wasn't that rope bridge from Indiana Jones Temple of Doom, was it? No, no. It was it looked nicer and newer than that, but it kinda had a it was sturdy. It looked sturdy, but it had like an interesting like had a big arch in the middle. It was it was strange. Was it red? Was, it was there not. a bay behind it? It was not. Okay. That would have so, been the Golden Gate Bridge. I, I, I know. I know just, <laughs> that's why I'm asking. He says he's in Tampa, but so Bill Dolman no, is uh, with his NBC Sports. What if he's camping in Canada? Then he needs oxygen. <laughs> I was going to say. Like, he needs, he needs lots. We have, to, we have to do a little bit of a deep dive on, on Bill's campfire situation Bill's over the past Bill's firefighting north of the border <laughs> while doing the interview. But Bill Dolman going to be with us. We'll have some comments from Trev Alberts. He was with the Husker Sports Network last night. His take on the schedule. And uh, we'll talk recruiting with Brady Oltman from Hale Varsity. Excited to talk with Brady. A lot of notable names going to be in town. Tomorrow for Nebraska football, the uh, monster recruiting weekend is June 23rd, but some names and uh, you've got a couple of wideouts at Bell West. When we talked to Coach Huffman, uh, one really being targeted hard by Nebraska, Isaiah McMorris, uh, stud ball player, also a stud ball player, Davon Hall. His recruitment uh, has uh, shifted and Pretty much ended with Nebraska World Re- World Herald report from Sam McEwen on that. We'll talk with Brady as Brady's got the lowdown on recruiting as well. So we'll get there at uh, 525. Then Daddy Burke loads us up. These in Sports Network. Daddy will have uh, some gambling takes. Game three. Make that game four with the Heat and Nuggets. What angle does Daddy see? Of course, Stanley Cup going on. So we'll end a Friday with Danny Burke. Uh, 489-1240. Uh, crew is weighing in with his expert opinion. Money line tonight. Crew is saying heat, money line. Ooh. Go for it. Yeah. I don't even know the line yet. I haven't got there. I think it was, was it four for the Nuggets? Yeah, I'm staying away. We're going to find something else to bet staking a beer on. Uh, I'll, Maybe I'll paper, here, rock, scissors. Or I'll just bite the bullet and and owe you two stakes. So let's get into some recruiting thoughts to start off. Uh, Mario Buford uh, saying yes to the Big Red. Uh, That's a significant get for Nebraska. Not only is he another Texas talent, but you have a uh, a brotherly connection, of course, uh, with older brother in Lincoln. 
and I think Nebraska's staff did a wonderful job of uh, following Coach Fisher's lead early in the recruitment because Buford was connected to and uh, interested in Nebraska through the last staff. You have his brother uh, on campus already, but Mario had some decisions to make, and it's one of those situations where you just can't take for granted big bros here, little bros going to come. Nebraska put the work in, uh, in Texas with him. Uh, You have Evan Cooper really doing a fantastic job to, to shore up the recruitment despite, despite the transition of staffs. And Nebraska had to, to fight here. You had Michigan State um, in on Mario Buford. You had Oregon offering Mario Buford two really notable programs and uh, a 2024 prospect, Elijah Nebraska, able to, to make it happen. And Buford's a three-star in some areas. On three, I believe, has him as a four-star, 5'11". And what's special about Mario... Listen, I like the attitudes and the coachability you get from Texas. I think that's very real. Kids in Texas, I think, are used to be being coached hard. It is a beyond a lifestyle in, in Texas with as much seven on seven that goes on. And with that seven on seven, I know it's not padded hitting, but it is technique work. It is extra work it is spring football work i mean you get a you 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 have a chance to get a more of a developed player if they drill down and and are part of those seven on seven sessions his team winning the seven on seven championship in the state of texas got really good ball skills and uh, his coverage skills speak for themselves as well and I, i did some film study on mario buford last night i'll get to that in just a second first some breaking news from kendall rogers regarding nebraska's pitching coach we'll get to that here in just a second as nebraska seems to know where they're going next uh but back down to- the hall well, we'll get to that here in just a second. But <laughs> first, uh, with Mario Buford, want to give him his due. Uh, I I dove into the the film a little bit last night. He's a guy that seems ready to go. Not maybe not college wise, but in terms of where he's at from a high school point of view, he seems ready to go in terms of coverage. Seems well ahead of his his peers in that sense. His closing speed's really good. He's got a solid looking back pedal. Great um, football IQ. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not a defensive back by any means, but he always seems to be in the right place at the right time, which. High football IQ, his closing speed's great, his recovery is great. Uh, you don't see him sticking his nose in and making tackles on bigger running backs all that much. Uh, he does have a couple plays in his highlight tape where he does a really good job going low, taking out the knees, uh, getting a running back to the ground. I'm not sure physically he's ready for the Big Ten, at least a freshman year. Since I Not think many gonna, are. He's going to need some development there. Uh, but you have a, a really good piece. He's an athlete in that back end. A really solid, fluid-looking mover. And, and what really stood out to me, I, I laid it out once, but uh, again, his closing speed, whenever that ball is in the air, he gets to where that ball is going to be very, very quickly. And, and there are times whenever it looks like he's... I don't want to say running the route for the receiver because I think that gets a little bit overused, but he is definitely a step ahead of where most high school guys are in terms of understanding where the break in the route is happening and beating the receiver to the punch and making a play on the ball. Do you think that's recognition or just he is that good an athlete lined up against good athletes and it shows? It's both. It's, it's understanding down and distance, understanding where the chains are, and then also he's able to get in and out of his breaks much faster than the receivers that he's going up against. The receivers get out of the break. He looks like he's a step behind. He's there. (laughs) He he, he looks like he's a a step behind on the break. And then within two strides, he's caught back up to the receiver. And within eight strides, you know, seven, eight strides, he has beat the receiver to the football. That's what really impresses me about him, his athleticism. And uh, it's another piece for Evan Cooper in that secondary. We'll see what we can do with him. What's what's nice for Mario's sake, and I, I don't think many seniors in high school want to hear this, but Nebraska's got a lot of talent in the secondary room right now, and he's not going to be pressed into service early. He's going to have some time to develop behind some defensive backs who uh, I think are, are pretty sound in their technique. He'll get some chance to learn, and I think he could be a guy that makes an impact maybe not one or two years down the road, maybe three, four years down the road. Well, thing two is I think what, what really was the kicker for Buford and a couple of the interviews uh, I've read and really good coverage from Brady Altman's from Hale Varsity is just how matter-of-fact Nebraska is with the kids they bring in. With, we're going to work with you, we're going to get you ready, and uh, we're going to put you in position to, to succeed 
in football and in life, and I know that's supposed to be how it goes, but that is Nebraska's message. And they don't play favorites. Uh, the Joel Starr interview I was reading talked a little bit about Buford saying, look, if you're a three-star, five-star walk-on, everyone's pretty much treated the same. Can you, can you go ball? Do you put the work in? Are you taking to coaching? And uh, it's, it's nice to have Nebraska get another Texas commit as I think they had, what, six last signing period 2023 and already four for 2024. So uh, Nebraska doing work in the Lone Star State, and uh, you'd expect that, but easier said than done. Let's get to your breaking news from Kendall Rogers, Elijah Herbal. Who is Nebraska's new pitching coach? That would be Rob Childress. Nebraska does, in fact, go down the hall, but I think the more notable piece of this news, and that's obviously notable, the Mm -hmm. fact that Childress has been elevated, but Nebraska is also able to pluck the recruiting coordinator and assistant coach from Wichita State, Mike Sirianni. No no relation to Philadelphia Eagles head coach Nick Sirianni. I believe Nick has a brother named Mike. No relation, completely different guy. Mike Sirianni, though, uh, was the ace recruiter for Wichita State over the past couple years. He helped to spearhead two of their best recruiting classes in history, of the Wichita State history, I should say. They were the number 32-ranked class in the country in 2021 and the number 26-ranked class in the country in 2022. Uh, He's gotten a couple of, uh, let's see... Yeah, first team uh, freshman All-American according to D1 Baseball, Cooper Kornblum, the most recent. So he's got an eye for talent. He is going to be uh, a big deal or a big part of this Husker baseball recruiting effort moving forward. I think that's a big hire for Nebraska. Mm-hmm. To get Mike Sirianni, it sounds like he's pretty well respected. And then Rob Childress, a guy that Jabba really appreciated sure. having his heading or as his pitching coach. Jabba said earlier this week that where Childress really – really makes his money is in the mentality side of the pitching game. And I think with Nebraska's consistency issues, that may be a big factor moving forward to try to get their mentality right uh, for next spring. It's going to be a do or die type season. So Childress elevated to pitching coach, Mike Sirianni, the new recruiting coordinator and assistant coach for Husker baseball. Wichita state has a, a clear history of success with their baseball program. And they've done it through, their region they've done it through their own 500 mile radius and they've had a couple of really really good ball players that once upon a time climbed the hill or found their way to third base in the great state of nebraska that went down there and played really good ball and ended up going to the majors yeah, and, or having a shot at the majors and mike sirianni in addition to what he did at wichita state he's familiar with the area too he's a he's a native of south central iowa no, it's about two hours to the east of Lincoln, but you're still within the area. Got good connections in Iowa. You got to expect that he's going to have good connections in the Nebraska area as well. If not, he's going to have to build those. But uh, you really like what Nebraska has here in terms of being able to to really build a, a Midwestern feature roster. And Sirianni's done that really, really well for Wichita State, and they have a hell of a baseball program down there. Uh, Jacob Adilla is about five minutes away. Just quick uh, cliff notes on Trev Alberts. We'll hear from Trev around 4.40 on what he thinks uh, on the schedule for Nebraska 2024-2025. But I like Trev's message, and Trev's message has always been consistent, and that is you build what you are in the big games. They're all big games till you – so you make that statement, and uh, you know the, the what are the what's the old coach speak? Uh, well, they're they're all big games, <laughs> pretty much, because if you don't pay attention or, or put the effort in, you drop one. Well, that was a big game; you lost one. So, Nebraska will no doubt raise their hand uh, with the primetime opportunity. We know what the schedule is, and Trev's understanding that you know that's your job is to to go win those to go win those big games, go win those maybe non-helmet games. And I think he's pretty excited for where Nebraska can go under under Coach Rule. I mean, that that is the plan. And uh, we'll hear from Trev, but he's raising his hand up for November primetime games, specifically when asked about, what about Gene Smith's comments about no night games in November? Trev's like, you know, bring him on. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. You'll hear from Trev himself. But good for Trev. I mean, those November night games, uh, 
Listen, use your home field, your home climate advantage. It's football, it's outdoors, it's the Big Ten. It's supposed to be cold and miserable. And not only good for Trev, good for the athletic department having what seems to be a unified front here because that hasn't always been the case over the last decade where the athletic director says one thing, the football coach says one thing, the chancellor says another. Like This is Matt Rule saying we want to embrace the conditions of Nebraska. We want to embrace the fact that it's not a fun place to play in November. And Trev Albert says, yeah, there's a primetime game in November. We want to embrace that. That's big for our community. It's big for building the brand of Nebraska. And as you already heard Matt Rule say, which, again, I'm not paraphrasing here, but it's Trev saying, yeah, Matt Rule wants to play games in, in November where the conditions are hard and we're going to be acclimated to them and our opponents aren't going to be. So it's Trev backing up his head coach saying, yeah, we want no- November night games. If Matt wants them, we want them. Well, and just be proactive and and workable be able to be a partner with your tv folks that want to put these games on you know, whether it's a 230 cbs or a night nbc showcase bring it on there's enough fireball in this state to keep you warm the fireball in wool socks fireball in wool socks the heated socks but the fireball is going to keep you warm don't overdo it but you know, get get that that wind chill. Give it the middle finger. You do so with some fireball. I hear. Uh, at least that's how maybe it, were, it went uh, when it came to college. We'll check in. Jacob Padilla is on the way. It's Hale Varsity. And now, and now back to Hale Varsity Radio. Back with the Hale Varsity Radio. We're presented by Currency. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal. We say hi to Jacob Padilla. HailVarsity.com and magazine. Jacob, uh, back on the hardwood, my friend. Uh, how's your Friday looking? Good. Uh, wrapped up the Creighton Prep uh, Boys Town shootout. I was at Prep all day today for the first part of the day. I uh, got to see a bunch of games there. And the rest of the weekend, the, uh, the Creighton team camp, uh, Friday night into Saturday. So a lot, a lot of hoops this weekend and getting a chance to see a lot of different teams. Who's stuck out? Who are some of the notable kids that you've had a chance to see? Well, uh, I watched Corian Gallatin from Fremont, a uh, sophomore, uh, dropped 33 points uh, on 12 of 20 shooting with seven threes uh, to beat Lincoln Northeast. Uh, he was outscoring the Rockets uh, by himself late into the first half. So that was probably the most impressive thing I, I saw today from an individual standpoint. Um, and then Prep, prep and Bell, Bell West, really good. Started off the day uh, with, with a close one that went to overtime. Uh, and Prep was really impressive. I scored Bell West 8 nothing in overtime. Trinell Parker, Dylan Clawson were, were, were good in that one. Carson Jones did not miss a shot. Scored 16 points in that game at 4-3. Uh, Bell West, I mean, you, you got a Jane Jackson, Elvin Turner. to really, really tough backcourt uh, coming back for them as well. Jacob Bedell is with us, HaleVarsity.com and Magazine, uh, weekend prep action. Jacob, a couple of thoughts on some prep uh, names. And uh, Bangot Dak, we, we love covering him at Southeast. And a commitment earlier this week to the University of Colorado. Yeah, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the coolest stories from the cycle. Like, a year ago, like, Bangot was playing on the – I guess the third team in the Supreme organization, the, the second Lincoln South, uh, Lincoln Supreme team uh, for, for his summer ball, and goes from that, gets a couple of D2 offers last summer, uh, then has a great senior year, or, or kind of one of the breakout players, um, lead, was their best player this past season, helped lead them to, to a state tournament appearance, and then um, this, this spring played with Nebraska Supreme, uh, uh, playing on that Under Armour, or Under Armour, uh, playing on that New Balance circuit, and he's he's been really solid for them. Uh, played really well and kind of earned earned this opportunity. He was planning to do a year of uh, prep school at Sunrise Christian, one of the best, uh, best prep schools in the country. Uh, but Colorado came in uh, a- after that commitment and decided, like, hey, we, we want you now. We want you, we want to get you here. We want to start kind of getting you in the program and uh, put some weight on you, getting you in the strength and conditioning program, and. Uh, Try to try to see what we can turn you into. So, uh, r- really cool story for him. The, the improvement he's made over the past year ha- has been really impressive. Uh, and now he's uh, got to go play in the Pac-12. Jacob, a trivia question for you here on a Friday. I just learned this a little bit earlier today. Do you know who the last Lincoln Prep hoop star was to go play for the University of Colorado? 
I do not. Who would that be? Alex Stivrens, father of Lauren Stivrens, ended up oh. making a bit of an NBA career out of it. He started his great Creighton and then transferred to Colorado. I, yeah, I, that's, that's a good name. That's a good fact. I didn't think about that. But I, I forgot that he went to Colorado after he was down at Creighton. That works well. And where do you project Dak at the college level? Yeah, um, we'll, we'll see what he looks like in a year. Uh, I, I'm, I'm anticipating a red shirt for them. Uh, this year to kind of try to get some weight on him, get him a little bit stronger there, um, and kind of see where he slots in there. Uh, it'll depend on kind of who we can guard, four or five, uh, about six nine, six ten, with a crazy long wingspan. I think he had it at 7'7 seven, seven on his uh, Twitter bio at one point. So uh, really, really long, really slender. Uh, again, he'll probably need that retro ear to, Try to try to add some weight, add some strength to his frame to be able to hold hold his own uh, at, at the, the high major level. Um, but yeah, they'll kind of a skilled uh, stretch big type is, uh, with some rim protection. Kind of can step out and shoot a little bit, uh, can handle a little bit, uh, and then uh, you can use that length to, to clean the glass and uh, protect the rim. So I think that's where he's going to slot in for them. Jacob, I'm kind of with you in that a year or two of development, getting in the weight room is going to be big for him, but you laid it out. He's a skilled stretch forward, which is really, it feels like the way the game is moving right now. And do you feel like Bangot could have a future beyond college if he's able to develop the right way at Colorado? You got those physical tools. Like you're going to have a chance to, to keep playing a long time at some, some level. Um, and I think, again, we got a lot of physical development to, to, mm-hmm. To be able to, to do that long term, got to continue to kind of keep the, that, that skill level high, polish up the jump for a little bit. Um, but yeah, I mean, again, that wingspan, I think that's probably the thing that first interested coaches the, the most, uh, even when he started getting interest last year and into this spring. is And it just, it just kind of changes the dimensions on the court when you've got someone that long that can impact that many shots defensively. And then you got a big catch radius on the offensive end where you can get him the ball in different spots and, and again, can, can kind of play through him or can have, have him on the receiving end of some lobs, can run some pick-a-pop type of stuff. So, yeah, I mean, we're, we're getting ahead of ourselves a little here, but, like, he's definitely got the physical tools as long as he can keep them stronger to, to keep playing this game a long time. Yeah, his athleticism's uh, been a ton of fun to watch and best to him in Boulder. Braden Frager, a really talented player for Southwest going into his junior season. We know about the Nebraska and Creighton offer, but how about old Coach Collins coming in and Northwestern firing off a, uh, an offer last week? Yeah, so he's starting to blow up a little bit, going even beyond the kind of in-state schools here now. Um, if he's, I, I, I didn't get to see him a ton in person in, in the spring, but uh, he must have played really, really well during those live periods when you had the D1 coaches watching this. Uh, again, it's one thing for the in-state uh, teams to take a look and say, hey, we got to get ahead on this kid. But if you got another high major coming in from outside the borders, like, yeah, we, we feel good offering as a junior, I think that tells you something. So it's uh, kind of going to be an interesting month for him. Southwest lost. Uh, a lot of change on that Southwest roster uh, around him. Um, and they're, they got some baseball kids missing. So it's, it's basically a lot of him and a bunch of newcomers. And basically everybody else uh, on the roster are kind of smaller guards. So uh, this month, uh, I think he'll really uh, will be big from working on kind of defense, rebounding, trying to guard bigger guys uh, and help his team out. So he'll have to kind of, Kind of step into a little bit more of a leadership role for Southwest here, uh, for a young kind of new look Southwest team, and so hopefully this this month will kind of help him progress in those areas as well to go with the physical talent. Jacob, going to flip over to football and the Big Ten laid out 2024 and 2025. Your reaction to Nebraska's schedule? Don't have to go uh, team by team, but but overall, what do you think? It's, it's kind of weird, uh, just kind of the, just all the changes over the last few years here with college football. It's everything so completely different than what it has been for, for quite some time now. It's visions going away. Obviously, all the new teams coming into the league. It, I guess it makes the the California teams feel a little bit more real. Um, seeing them on the schedule there, and still, like obviously, you knew the news happened, and like yep, they're in the Big Ten now, but. That still was kind of a ways down the road. You're just focusing on what the Big Ten looks like now. 
and now you're seeing that schedule, and you're like, oh, yep, there they are. <laughs> so um, I, kind of, I guess that kind of makes it a little bit more real, and then that adds the, the kind of dimension of the scheduling work. you got to factor in that kind of travel and figure out how exactly you want to handle that with those California trips for those teams and for teams heading out there. So uh, I, I'm kind of the kind of person I don't really get uh, stuck into, like, schedule talk, and like, honestly, I did not even look at it because um, I'm kind of more of like, all right, I'm going to look at the schedule for the next two, three weeks. Where do I need to be when? Uh, and that's as far as I'll go because uh, it's all the various things that I try to keep up with. Uh, but the kind of the Iowa being the one protected rival uh, is kind of interesting, but it makes sense. As one of the newer teams coming into the league, I, I can understand them. The teams that have been around a long time and have developed more history with, with other schools you kind of load up on those teams with kind of more of the, project, uh, the protected rivalries where you're going to see teams, each other uh, every year. Nebraska's still kind of uh, establishing that. I mean, obviously they've been in the Big Ten a long time now, but uh, they're still newer than most of the other league outside of the ones that they joined with, and obviously the, the Pac-12 schools coming in now. So that makes sense. If you were to give a power ranking right now, is Nebraska – in the top half of the 16-team field for football? Oh, uh, I have no idea. <laughs> That's, I, I, I'm, you, would, you would hope so, but um, they, they, they weren't obviously last year, and now you got two teams that'll, that'll make it even tougher. Right? There's not a lot of bad teams, even the kind of the lower ones. You, you, there's some interesting things going on with, with the coaching there. Some of the moves they've made. I'm see Maryland gotten better over the last few years. We'll, we'll see um, with Rutgers under Shiano, um, Illinois um, trying to make some moves there. So we'll, we'll see what happens with Purdue under Walters. Like there, there's so many changes there, and I still don't have a great feel for what this Nebraska team is going to be. Like a lot of it will come down to that offensive line and, and just them. Can Nebraska put out a demonstrably better? offensive line and, and pass catching unit around him, or is him going to be the kind of guy we saw at Georgia Tech where, yeah, made some highlight plays, but the, the down-to-down efficiency just wasn't there. So I, I, I honestly do not have a great feel for this team at all right now as we stand kind of heading into the summer. Jacob, last thought here, about 15 seconds. Do you think USC and UCLA have as difficult a transition to the Big Ten as Nebraska had? I know they, they made it to the Big Ten championship in year two, but I don't think you can call the on-field results since Nebraska joined the Big Ten a success. It's interesting because, like you said, like they were in a solid place. coming. I don't even know if it's so much the transition as like they, they had some momentum coming in the league and they just weren't able to build on and capitalize. Like, with the, the Pelini era kind of going the way it did and then the coaching changes since. I don't know that they, they would have done that much better had they stayed in the Big 12 or anything. Um, I think it's more about Nebraska that, than kind of the conference in. There's not some uh, complicating factors there with how recruiting changes and uh, scheme changes and all that type of stuff to, to match with it. But ultimately, I think it comes down to the, the people making the decisions. And um, we'll see, I think both uh, UCLA and USC are uh, in solid, uh, solid places coming into the league. Um, we'll, again, we'll see since from a uh, in the transport portion of it that it's going to be a, a tougher adjustment for them, where they half half their trips are making cross country, whereas the the rest of the conference only has to make that trip once a year or, or so, once every other year, depending on kind of who lands on their schedule. So um, that, I think just from a logistics standpoint, they, they've got a bigger adjustment. But um, we'll see kind of what their, their coaching situation uh, heading into the league, if they can maintain where they are and kind of move forward in the Big Ten. Whereas Nebraska, they came in in a solid place and just weren't able to, to, to maintain that with, with, again, the people in charge and the decisions they made. Jacob Padilla, HaleVarsity.com and magazine at Jacob Padilla underscore. Give him a follow and uh, read him with Hale Varsity. Jacob, take care. Have a great weekend. Thanks for a few minutes. And now, and now back to Hale Varsity Radio. Back with you. Big thanks to Jacob Padilla, HaleVarsity.com and Magazine. 25 minutes away, Bill Dolman joins us. Brady Altman's to hit recruiting weekend for Nebraska. And uh, yes, Daddy Burke back from VEASAN 
to get you locked in on the NBA Finals Game 4 and a look-see with the NHL Stanley Cup. So Trev Albert's able to react to the schedule drop yesterday. Nebraska's AD uh, spent time with the uh, the Husker Network and uh, had a lot to say and get into when it comes to protected rivalries, uh, how the Big Ten filtered through all the different requests logistically, and uh, really what the Big Ten is now and is going to be even bigger in about two years with that Saturday showcase. And Elijah, I think Nebraska and the rest of the Big Ten see the opportunity but quite honestly, the, the Big Ten can absolutely own Saturday. It's not that the SEC primetime moments and contests won't be wow. They will be. They'll be big time. Uh, uh, the, the Big 12 is still going to garner some attention, as will Clemson and the ACC. See what the, the University of Miami does. Can Carolina bounce back? But all in all, I mean, you'll have morning, afternoon, night covered with Great football matchups in the Big Ten, and a lot of playoff potential. I mean, yeah, it's, it's as simple as that. That's that's what the the pro is with expansion, and that's why we've been forecasting for about two or three years on this show now that yeah, the Big Ten is going to continue to expand, uh, even past USC and UCLA. It's going to get bigger. It's going to get bigger. The SEC is going to get bigger, and it's it's for the reason you just laid out. You're trying to own Saturdays. I you do. Know, like it, it sounds harsh. But the Big Ten... Live or streamed, you will own it. <laughs> the Big Ten, their goal, as harsh as it sounds, is to go bury conferences like the Pac-12 and the Big 12 and the ACC in ratings. We're going to steal your best teams. We're going to put their games on our networks against our teams. People are going to watch. And people are going to watch our games instead of your games. It's as simple as that. It sounds harsh to say, but that's what the Big Ten's goal is has been since they added Nebraska, since they added Maryland, since they added Rutgers, now adding USC and UCLA whenever they go add their next batch of schools. That's their goal. And that's the Big Ten getting closer and closer with the the, the conference announcement yesterday. Here is Trev when it comes to the reaction and the process of the schedule for Nebraska and the Big Ten 2024-2025. You know, anytime you have uh, a 16-team league and you play nine conference games, there's going to be variations. There's going to be, you know, nuance to the scheduling. And, you know, the, the real key to a scheduling uh, philosophy and concept is, is it has to be consistent over time. You know, you, you, you can't look at a schedule in the vacuum or silo of one year. Um, when, when you're not playing everybody in a true round robin, you know, ultimately what ends up happening is you have to go through several years to have things kind of even out. Uh, so this was a... An interesting and long process that um, obviously included uh, former commissioner Kevin Warren. It's included Tony Petiti and all the athletic directors. And uh, I think the one thing you will acknowledge is when you look at everybody's schedule in the Big Ten, the reality is the Big Ten is a, a very difficult conference. Every single Saturday, you're going to have an opportunity to win games or lose games. And um that's why I'm so pleased to have Coach Rule as our coach. Uh, attention to detail and fundamentals are going to be critically important as we try to navigate through these types of schedules every year. He nailed it. You need to be able to avoid self-injury and then go out slug the other guy. Trev comments on the protected rivalry game with Iowa gets more in-depth with that request process. Nebraska did request three. Gary and I talked uh, immediately. It both agreed that the Iowa-Nebraska rivalry needed to, to continue. And so ultimately, Greg, what the process was is, is we were asked by the league, and this was all independent, is if you protected one game, who would you select? And obviously for us, you know, it was Iowa. And then it was if you wanted to protect two games, who would you select? And... Um, you know, I submitted um, Iowa and Wisconsin. And then if you want to select three protected games, who would you select? And obviously, geographically for me, Minnesota made a lot of sense. But then all of a sudden, a little gamesmanship started happening. You know, you can imagine, well, hey, well, if we could submit protected games, you know, maybe we should just select the three teams that have been the least successful over the last five to ten years in the Big Ten and protect them. So, obviously, that wasn't going to work. And so, 
ultimately, you know, as all of these other teams submitted who their protected rivals were, you know, sometimes you submit a protected rival and that school doesn't submit you as a protected rival. So there's nuance there. How many teams said, yeah, we'll take Nebraska? Yeah, that was, that was my reaction to Trev's thought. Like, oh, this is this is more complicated than just going and picking the, the teams that have been – the three teams that have been least successful in the Big Ten, yeah, it gets a little complicated whenever you look at that list and realize Nebraska's among those three. Got a rash of Rutgers and Nebraska requests here. <laughs> Penn State wants to play Rutgers in Nebraska. Ohio State wants to play Rutgers in Nebraska uh, eight times a year. Uh, four and four. We'll even travel. Who's on the horn? We got Artez on the line. All right. I've missed hearing from him. Artez, what do you know? What's up, guys? How you doing? Good. Where are you at right now? Where are you trucking? I'm actually uh, south southeast Iowa. I'm about an hour from Davenport. I'm sorry to hear gonna that. Going to be in uh, Lincoln this weekend. Um, oh, good. Uh, brother, my brother Curtis is retiring after uh, 20 some years with the Lincoln School District. So oh, good. Well, congrats to congrats place. to Curtis, man, and so thanks for what, all the work. What's, what's the forecast in Lincoln this weekend? While I'm headed that way tomorrow night. Well, we got about a 70 percent chance of of rain tomorrow, but mid 80s, and we'll be uh, upper 70s for Sunday. Can't, we can't have rain, man. You're going to mess up my afro, man. We can't well, <laughs> I got baseball this weekend, man, so uh, I, 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 I feel you. you. I feel you there. So 83 days away from Husker football, huh? We are. We're counting down and just hearing from Trev and better uh, better giddy up, right? Get right this yeah. year and be ready uh, in two and three years and beyond. So is Junior playing baseball this summer? He, he is. He's a pitcher for the uh, Southwest awesome. JV team. So, he, uh, yeah, he's, he's been an adventure. God love him. Now, my son, my son teaches at a, a Northeast uh, school there in Lincoln, my oldest son. Okay. Now, are they, are they building another high school within the next two or three years? Is they, that, am I hearing that again? They just built two. There's Northwest, oh, and then there's – How many are there now? A lot. A I lot. can't count that high. But, uh, yeah, a lot, a lot. So, you feeling all right about the schedule? Yeah, I like it. I mean, it, it is what it is. I mean, we, you got to play what they give you. So, mm-hmm. um I noticed USC's got a tough one, and you so you kind of expected that to happen, though. So L- little hazing to to welcome them here. <laughs> You're right. We yeah now now we don't have to worry about getting hazed anymore. They can haze them. <laughs> it's our turn to pass it on. <laughs> I'm just curious. Uh, I'm gonna let you guys go, but I want to let fill me in on the top three uh, tailbacks and top three quarterbacks going into the fall. Well, I think Anthony Grant is your returner. He's almost a thousand yard rusher. He's uh, pretty special, Elijah. I think I know he. he uh, Gabe Irvin's also going to be your thumper back, the and then ball. yeah. But then you have Ramir Johnson and your quarterbacks. Of course, Sims is going to be the guy, and I don't know who to who to play second. I know Chuba had a good finish to the spring. That's from the coaches, Chuba Pretty. And uh, Harburg, of course, the uh, the big kid from from Carney. I think he did some nice things. Artez, we hope to bump into you, man. Thanks for the phone call today. Yes, sir. You guys have a good one. And oh. give give our love to your brother. He was always a friendly face around the halls of Southeast. Yes, sir. We'll do. All right, Artez Craig, uh, giving us a shout. We'll wind down hour one on the way. And now, and now back to Hale Varsity Radio. Big thanks to uh, Artez for calling in, checking in. Can always dial us up at 489-1240. The stream comments we'll get to in a moment. Some emails as well we may hold for tomorrow morning in the weekend edition of Hale Varsity. Myself, Elijah Herbal, Mr. Mark Cranach. Reminder to get buckled up. Use your seatbelt. It saves lives, prevents injuries only if properly worn. Buckle up. A message from the Nebraska Department of Highway Safety Office. Reset the baseball news of the day with Rob Childress. Yes, this coming from Kendall Rogers of D1 Baseball. We'll give credit where credit is due. His scoop of the day that Husker Baseball is promoting Rob Childress to be the a head pitching coach for the University of Nebraska. Also, they will be adding 
former Wichita State assistant Mike Sirianni uh, to round out their full-time staff. Sirianni is the ace recruiter for Wichita State, led a couple of uh, great recruiting classes for the Shockers in the past two years. So he's going to come up and have a big recruiting role for Nebraska. As for Childress, he will be uh, moving back to pitching coach. Mm. And uh, you can go check out our interview with Jabba Chamberlain from earlier this week. Check it out in podcast form. Jabba with some rave reviews from what he learned from Rob Childress, specifically regarding that mentality that you need to take the mound. Sirianni, also volunteer coach at Wichita State in the mid-teens, did well there, played ball at Creighton before going to Arkansas State. So uh, a, uh, an Iowa native, so knows this Midwest region well. Matt asks the question about UCLA. Everyone keeps talking about UCLA like they're a really heavy hitter. You know, they've never won more than 10 games, not once. Fact check me. Matt, I, I haven't dialed up the UCLA Chronicles for a while. I know they won a national championship. Before the season was 12 games. Yes. So. But I'm thinking even so with a bowl game, was it a 10-1 deal? I think they won the national championship mid-60s. But you're right, even their great teams, the Cade McNown team that got to rematch and then got doused by, Will, uh, check that, Edger and James against Miami. That team went 10-3, and 10-2. And, and then the Troy Aikman team that outscored Nebraska in 88. I think they ended up 10-2 and two in the Cotton Bowl. They did end up 10-2 and two with a win in the Cotton Bowl. Arkansas? Uh, that is a great question. They think they beat Arkansas. Okay, I'm, I'm looking back. I'm fact-checking Matt here. There has never been a season from UCLA football with more than 10 wins. They've gotten to 10, uh, looks like seven times in their history, but they have never exceeded the 10-win mark. Last one, 98? Last one was 2014. Ah. The Jim Mora team. The Jim, Jim Mora got him at 10 and 4. That, uh, uh, I guess 2013, 2014, they, uh, they got 10 wins back-to-back. Okay, so yeah, and then they blew him out. All he did was recruit NFL talent. He did go four and eight in 2016, uh, and then six and seven in 2017. Let's be honest. We're, Josh Rosen's lucky that he didn't get locked in an electrical storage closet. It's a, it's a Lee reference. Yeah, I thought so. I didn't know yeah, if that was yeah, the Lee yeah, reference yeah, you were yeah, going yeah, for. Yeah, or not. That's it's what it was. Little, yeah, it's a bit of a top rope reference there. It was because <laughs> Josh Rosen is hated by everybody, including his teammates. I hope that's not the case, but uh, top ten pick that is still maybe bouncing around. Is he still in the league? I don't know. He's. I think he signed with somebody. He's got to be. I don't know. I, I another fact check is Josh Rosen still. Yes, he is a backup quarterback for the Arizona Cardinals. Okay. But they drafted him top 10, and then they went and got Tyler Murray a year later. <laughs> oh, we're just going to recruit over I mean, draft over you. <laughs> top 10 quarterback. That's a sign of, ooh, we messed up. <laughs> yeah, you're not mature, son. Let's get uh, in touch with Bill Dolman, hour two on the way, with Hale Varsity presented by Currency. The voice of Husker Nation is on the air. This is Hale Varsity Radio. Insight, opinion, expertise, along with the biggest names talking Nebraska sports. Join in with the show at 402-489-1240 or 1-800-825-5865. Now, here are your hosts, Chris Schmidt and Elijah Herbel. Back with you, Tower 2. It's Hale Varsity Radio. We're presented by Currency. For all your equipment financing needs, go Currency. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal. He is rocking his NBA Finals hat. Elijah is pumped for Game 4. The Pride of Fairbury, NBC Sports professor. It's the summer of adventure for Wild Bill. Bill Dolman, find him on Twitter at Bill Dolman. Billy D, it's been uh, 100 years since we've talked. How are we doing? Well, I appreciate you uh, once again lifting the suspension. <laughs> or I don't know if you were suspending yourself against doing the show with me. Either way, yeah, it's uh, nice to talk to you again as I make my tour through the uh, summer of the 80s. I like it. Do you have a, a Hawaiian shirt? Do you have Ray-Bans? And are you going with the uh, Lagoon swimming trunks? I've got my acid wash jeans on, my Ray-Bans, and a uh, cut-up rat T-shirt going to Ario Speedwagon tonight. You are going sleeveless. I like it. Bill Dolman joining us. <laughs> Bill gets a bandana. I got a red bandana too. Nice. It's not hanging yeah. out your back pocket. It's around your your forehead. Correct. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. 
I got to make sure we identify there. Uh, so, interested in thoughts here. Beverage of choice for our friends from UCLA or USC when they come to Memorial Stadium in November for those cold, cold November rain games? Well, if we're, if we're going to be hospitable to them, uh, it's one thing. If we're going to you know, have some fun with people who can't handle the cold November rain, you know, <laughs> then it's an entirely different thing altogether, perhaps served in a... Uh, uh, I'll, uh, a steel pipe or something like that and, you know, get triple dog dare him to do something, right? Sure. Sure. I was saying fireball uh, will keep you warm. Uh, Matt weighed in with some aftershock. I don't know that I've ever had aftershock. Uh, Uncle Andy would say McCormick's vodka. Give him the best. <laughs> give, me to, give, me, give me to break out my Boda bag and see what's still in there from 1988. That might work. I was watching some highlights of UCLA Nebraska 88. That's a forgettable ball game. But no, what do you think here? The schedule drops. It's going to be a grinder. Loved what Trev had to say last night. And, and credit him, too, for coming out, you know, right, right away to. Uh, uh, to address it so that people are wondering what's what's Nebraska's position on the schedule, you know? Because I think a lot of people are going, looking at it, going, is this good or bad? What do we think? And and I credit him for coming out and saying, look, this is what the process was. I know that there are a couple of games that they're still holding back because they're just waiting to make the big announcement to drum up a little more attention to it. Um, but, uh, you know, I think it, it's what – we anticipated life in the Big Ten was going to be like, and uh, it's going to be tough. Um, and, I, and I said, I think last week or a couple weeks ago, whenever the SEC came out with its, you know, uh, four-game powder puff schedule and eight games against uh, directional hyphenated schools, that eventually they're going to have to evolve as well, as the two power conferences are going to have to have some parallels, and and they're going to, you know, they're going to have to go to nine games. And it's going to be arduous for everybody. And people are just going to have to get used to, you know, college football teams having seasons like the NFL where you win, uh, you know, 12 games or not just in the 12, nine, nine games, and you're going to lose three and have a great team, right? Very few teams flirt with unbeaten records in the NFL. But you're going to have a national champion between the two super conferences you know, that their records are going to have a, maybe two or three losses. They made it to the playoff, and then they made it through that grinder. So fans everywhere are going to have to get used to, you know, accepting three losses, four losses a year and still consider that great. Bill Dolman's with us here. It's Hale Varsity Radio. And, Bill, one of the, the things this schedule release reminds me of as time goes on, something we've talked about on the air before. Are you familiar with the story of the Chinese farmer? Okay. Tell me. It's, Uncle Elijah. So we, we went through it a couple weeks ago. And it's, there was a once upon a time, there was a, a Chinese farmer whose horse ran away. Okay. All the neighbors came to his house that night to say, oh, man, we're, we're so sorry that your horse has run away. That's, that's very you've unfortunate. Heard, you've told this before. I have told this one before. And, and he said, maybe. And it, basically, the, the story goes, a whole bunch of good, followed by bad, followed by good things happening. And the moral of the story is that you're not able to know whether something is good or bad until you get the benefit of hindsight. Is that fair with this schedule release, that it's hard to evaluate Nebraska's schedule moving forward, if this is going to be difficult, if it's going to be good for Nebraska's rebuild, if it's going to be bad for Nebraska's rebuild until you get that benefit of hindsight? I think it's going to be good for Nebraska's rebuild because, you know, again, the exposure for being in the conference with a new TV deal that, you know, if it hasn't been, you know, fully signed and agreed to, it's going to be. So it's going to be great for Nebraska. And Travis certainly said, yeah, we embrace playing whatever night game you want us to play whenever. Even if Michigan and Ohio State don't want to play at night, okay, fine. Put Nebraska in that slot. People will watch Nebraska. There's going to be inroads into California. That, that game in, at UCLA in 2024, there'll be more red in the stands than powder blue. You know, that's going to be like the Notre Dame game of 2001. When I saw that schedule that come out yesterday, my first thought was, yeah, Nebraska's got to go to UCLA, but Nebraska's already in Los Angeles and in California. There's going to be a, a thousands and thousands of people they're going to, you know, flock to L.A. in red, right? So, you know, the, the, <laughs> Nebraska's going to win the battle on the stands in, in that game. And I think, you know, we all know that. 
California for Nebraska is still a very powerful entity. So uh, in, that, in, in, in all regards, it's positive because Nebraska is in the Big Ten. The money is going to be there. The exposure is going to be there. You hope you have the coach in place who's going to build the program back to where it was. And, or, you know, not again, relatively speaking, not 13 and 0, 14 and 0, or whatever. But, you know, Nebraska is making inroads in Texas with its recruiting. They're going to be able to, to say, hey, California kids, Arizona kids, we're going to be out here every year. Your family's going to be able to see you play. We've got a couple of games or more that are going to be out in your neighborhood. And your teams are also going to be coming. So, uh, to Lincoln. So, everything I think is positive in that regard. It's just going to be what our expectations for future success going to look like. And that, that, I think, is what Nebraska fans and fans everywhere have to come to grips with. You're not going to have unbeaten seasons anymore. It's just not going to happen for anybody. You look at that, uh, that ringer that is going to be the new West Coast schools uh, on top of what's been your traditional East powers, and now all bets are off to Elijah's point about the divisions going away. And... Bill, we asked Searles this yesterday. I want to get your take. Does the Big Ten start out with the over-under at three for the 12-team playoff? Oh, that's I, – I would, I would think that's probably the number to hit, and I would think it's going to be, you know, probably in that – with the 12-team playoff, I think there's going to be room for four from the Big Ten, four from the SEC, and four people at the kids' table who are getting a chance to come uh, to have macaroni and cheese for a, for a day. You know, Clemson, and Notre Dame. You look at, who else? You look at you. You look at what all the other conferences are going to have, and again, it's just they just the meat isn't there, mm-hmm. right? Um, you know, the, the, we talked about it last week with the Big 12. Who are they going to answer that they're a coast-to-coast conference? And I was thinking after we got them talking, the marquee game in the Big 12 is going to be BYU and Utah. That's going to be the marquee rivalry matchup for uh, the Big 12 conference. I mean, think about that. It's not going to be I mean, Oklahoma, Oklahoma State. No, that's gone. Texas, Oklahoma, they're taking you know their act to the SEC. It's I'm trying to think what Baylor, the Texas Tech, rivalry is like Kansas State and Kansas. Baylor, TCU, Baylor, Texas Tech, TCU, Texas I, Tech. Okay, I'm, okay, I'm, I'm telling you, none of those feel like BYU rivalries. and Utah will be the most marquee marquee game on the Big Twelve slate going forward. TCU and Baylor. Texas, Texas Tech and TCU, C- Central Florida and Cincinnati, the, 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 rival, the instant rivalry that the Big 12 has for its marquee game on Thanksgiving weekend will be BYU and Utah. That's what's left for the Big 12. Meanwhile, Iowa and Nebraska, they preserved it. Michigan, Ohio State, uh, Wisconsin, and who are they going to have? Minnesota at the end of the year. Penn State and whomever they determine Penn State's rivalry is going to be, I guess they really didn't give them one. But there are so many more big games. And, then, of course, with you know, the SEC offerings. So the other conferences are going to scramble to fill the other four spots, and they're going to be given to them out of charity. Mm. So, yeah, I think it's over. I think it's, yeah, I think it's four minimum for the Big Ten and the SEC. Because what's going to be left of the ACC? Especially if they get poached, if North Carolina and Duke gets poached, and Florida State and Clemson get poached, I mean the ACC is is in the, is in the same bed with the Pac-12. They might as well merge and have that great rivalry uh, showcase between Oregon State and Washington State, or let's marry the two conferences and whatever's left over. You guys have rivalry games on Thanksgiving. Let us know how it turns out. <laughs> Bill, say the the college conferences do expand to 20 or 24 teams something we talked about yesterday do you foresee a a day when the college football schedule is no longer 12 games at say 14 or 16 well then you know you're gonna have at some point the academicians will probably say you know gilbert lewis and poindexter we need to in you know Flex a little muscle here to say that we still care about academics, and so they will probably say in in, in terms of 
you know, what's best for the player. <laughs> Although, you know, what they're going to be asking volleyball and wrestling and all the other sports to do with their travel, they, they could really kind of care less. I think we know they turn a blind eye to that. Mm-hmm. But they're going to say in the interest of play, football players, they will probably, I, I would bet, dial it back and maintain a, a 12-game regular season schedule so that you're not, te- you know, if you're going to make the playoff, you probably tapped out at, what, 15 games? That's probably going to max out in that regard. And then other teams are going to get a bonus game if the bowl game still exists. So teams are probably going to get, you know, 12 to 13 games a year. And I really do. I think university presidents are, presidents are going to say, well, we need to maintain the academic integrity of the student-athlete, right? And so that's where they'll step in and say, this is what, this is what we're going to say. But how much money are we going to make? <laughs> right the the live ball <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> right yeah. yeah in in 10 years we're going to be kicking off in um in 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 the uh, united arab emirates or in saudi arabia they're going to buy a a kickoff classic oh. and 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 the way we go what was the the classic yeah. scott frost quote in uzbekistan yeah right that was a uh, borat borat take yeah, wouldn't that be something though? If, if some uh, outside entity decided to put together some college football conference with whatever's left over from the Big Ten and the SEC, and decide that they're going to have uh, a college football league of their own, mm. uh, and 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 make it uh, lucrative, or maybe that'll maybe that'll be the power too, and uh, you know we'll have all kinds of different sponsorships from uh, global entities involved. But really, like it's the Big Two. And then whatever, I think you have to commend the Big 12 for really trying to do whatever it can to, uh, to, to market itself. That They've got a marketing guy for a conference commissioner. The Big 12 now has a TV, or the Big 10 has the TV guy in Petiti. You know, who, who knows what's going to happen with the, big, or with the Pac-12. And look at, look at Notre Dame with a new athletic director. They're bringing in a guy from the NBC Sports Group. Mm-hmm. So the, the people who are in charge of collegiate athletics all have marketing or TV backgrounds. It's not like it used to be you know, just a few years ago. Bill, going to wrap with this. Uh, Nebraska making a move this week with Jeff Christie. Announced earlier today, uh, Will Bolt tabbing Rob Childress to be the new pitching coach. Mike Seriati is going to be an assistant recruiting coordinator. He's coming up from Wichita State. Thoughts on Rob Childress uh, back at the helm as pitching coach for Nebraska? Yeah, I don't think it's fair to say that when Will made that move to bring him on board a couple of years ago that this was the plan all along. I, I don't believe that, and I know that there have been whispers over the last 48 hours that you know this was what he was going to. I don't believe that. I think he was loyal to Jeff Christie as a, as a former teammate and fellow assistant. And I think Rob was there in you know the position that he wanted to be in because he wanted to be at Nebraska, and it was a great opportunity. Um, you know, Nebraska's pitching staff just didn't evolve positively. There were good moments last year, but overall, you know, when you when you have back-to-back seasons like Will Bolt has had, where there's just there's just always something not there. You, you know that there's probably going to be a change made, and you don't have monster staffs like you do in football, so you've got to go with you know somebody who might be close to you, and then the, the change is a little more obvious. And you know I don't think they make Jeff Christie a scapegoat. They're just trying to do something to instill a positive change on the staff, be better during midweek, and you've got a great guy who's very well respected in Rob Childress, and you, know, you might as well tap into all the expertise from them that you can, and do it the way that the, the rules state that you have to do it. And unfortunately, that means Jeff Christie has to go. And I'm sure that was a very, very mm-hmm. difficult decision for Will Bolt, but onward for Nebraska baseball, and I'm sure they'll have a great year next year. All right, thirty seconds. Are you surfing and turfing tonight, steak and and, and some shrimp, or what are you doing on the beach? Uh, that's a good idea. I hadn't really thought about that. Uh, um, you know, I was still more, you know, kind of inclined with uh, what was I going to offer my friends from UCLA when they come to down in mid-November. Um, but, you know, I, as much as I'd like to go back to whatever I had back in the 1980s, uh, it might be an old-fashioned kind of night or a nice pint of Guinness. All right. Well, and you and I, we got to get it locked in. Uh, we got to do a live road show in 2024 from the Viper Room. Yeah, happy to have you buy me dinner and drinks wherever. Viper Room on Sunset. That's what I'm saying. You can run into your boy Vince and, and Axel and rock company. It, rock and roll and roll the crew. Uh-huh. Bill, take care. Thanks for the time, bud. 
All right, be good, guys. Go Big Red. There he is, Bill Dolman. Brady Altman's recruiting thoughts. Husker football next. And now. And now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. Get the uh, podcast and do it. Subscribe doesn't cost you anything. Spotify, iTunes, Google Play. Hale Varsity Radio. I test is a podcast. Of course, Brady Oldman's part of that. At Brady Oldman's on Twitter. Recruiting man, Husker beat reporter with Hale Varsity. Brady, what's the jersey we're rocking? It looks like a throwback Bernie Kosar jersey. <laughs> no, actually, it's a it's an old school Nelson Tigers jersey. Ah. Um, the I, I saw on Twitter, I suited up varsity, shared a picture of Laurel Peterson as an all-state quarterback for the Nelson Tigers. And I tweeted at Kirk Peterson, his son, who I, my, my oldest brother went to, was a classmate of his. And I played with two of Kirk's younger brothers. And I was like, you know, did you, did you submit this kind of thing? And then kind of nostalgia got me digging into the closet and digging it up. And to be honest, I forgot I was wearing it at the moment. So I like it. Jersey Friday. Maybe we, we start something as long as we get Elijah to a tanning bed. You know? I could just wear something with longer sleeves as well. Or, or sleeves underneath. No, <laughs> no, I'm not going to go that far. Okay, well. <laughs> On the summertime. I'm, I'm, I'll, 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 I'll bounce into that if you guys want to commit yeah, to well, it. I got to get a jersey first, you know. <laughs> but Hey, let's dive into the recruiting weekend, Brady and First, we, we want your take on, on Mario Buford, his commitment last night. Oh, well, full disclosure, I like Mario a lot. Um, I think he jumps out on paper, on film. He's also like, well, I mean, Loki, he's a fun, fun guy. Um, mm-hmm. Marquise is a, is a fun guy to talk to, very bright personality. Um, and Mario's the same. You know, it's very clear when you, you talk with him, you know, you, you, you see the clips, you hear interviews, and you even get a chance to chat with him. It, you can tell that they're related, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But he he really stepped up his game this last year for DeSoto, kind of came to his own. He got significant, uh, consistent playing time throughout the year, and he made the most of it. Uh, his head coach, Claude Mathis, shared with me a, a couple of things throughout the season, said that he really evolved as a, as a, role, as a role model uh, in a leadership role on that team. And lo and behold, DeSoto goes undefeated and wins the state championship, which in Texas is, uh, you can't really, uh, you can't really complain about that. He brought his, his championship ring on his official visit. And then I think it was a foregone conclusion, but he finally made the deal and, um, it's a big get for Nebraska Mm -hmm. for sure. Brady Oltman's with us here. It's Hale Varsity Radio. And Brady, my scouting report from hour one, and I want to get your take on it was it's a guy with a lot of athleticism. It's a guy that really in coverage, he, he breaks on the ball very well. His closing speed's good. Not sure how well he's going to be able to stack up physically with the Big Ten early in his career, but I think that's something that's going to develop. He's a guy that could be a special piece for you two, three, maybe four years down the road. Is that fair? Yeah, I think so. Uh, he's, he's shown a willingness to be physical at the line and, and physical when, when defending um, either when uh, – before breaks and, and out of breaks, you know, even past the, the in the kind of uh, halo area of bump and run. He, I don't know, like physically you throw him into the Big Ten now, I don't know if you could say like, hey, you're 17, you know, go cut it up with Marvin Harrison Jr. I think that that's where a couple of, of months or even a year in, you know, Campbell's weight, weight regimen mm-hmm. is going to help him. But step one is having a willingness to step up there and go toe to toe with those guys. And he certainly has that right now. So it's, I, I think that that's a promising thing when you look at him. Brady Oltman's talking recruiting with us. Hail Varsity Radio at Brady Oltman's on Twitter, HailVarsity.com magazine, where you find Brady. Okay, the weekend visit list, and I know that Isaiah McMorris and Nebraska uh, seem to have um, things heating up. I know he's going to get worked out this weekend. Stone Sanders also in the quarterback from Allentown, Pennsylvania. Uh, give us a, an update here uh, with uh, McMorris and, and how things have intensified. Well, McMorris is, is one that I think Garrett McGuire is really clicking on all cylinders. You see, you see a lot of these athletes from Texas and Florida, especially at the receiver position, really kind of resonate with Nebraska. I think a common denominator there is, is Garrett McGuire's ability to relate to them and get them fired up. He's a really good. He's a really good coach, and he's really good at breaking things down fundamentally for these kids. And I think McMorris resonates with that. Uh, I think, if, I believe, the last thing I heard out of Isaiah was that he hasn't locked in a visit yet to USC, but he wants to do that. 
still this summer before coming to a decision. I think he wants to get all of his visits lined up before he comes to a commitment. Mm -hmm. But Nebraska's really, I think Nebraska's really trending upward, certainly trending upward now from where they were, say, six months ago uh, with, with his recruitment. But he could be a really good one that they see. And I think part of it is they, they'd like to see him work out in person and see mm-hmm. him do that to really kind of push things over the edge. Nebraska in a, in a bit of a fight. And I know Niles Paul is a relative of uh, McMorris. And Niles is pushing him to Lincoln or trying to anyway. But USC, Penn State, Oklahoma, uh, really heavy in the mix as well. Your take on Davon Hall and the situation there with Nebraska and Davon going the separate ways? Well, it's it's one that I think it's – Matt Rule has said this before, that he wants Nebraska guys. You know, mm-hmm. he wants guys that believe in Nebraska, that are going to be totally committed to Nebraska, all of that. Like, that he wants people who want to be at Nebraska. Uh, he's he's going to be very upfront. He's going to be very transparent with people. Um, he's – like, like um, the Willis McGahee situation is a good one. McGahee said that while committed to Nebraska – He's going, he already gave his word to take an official visit to UCF. And he told the, the coaching staff that. And Matt Rule said, hey, absolutely, go do it. You know, you gave your word, I, and I want you to see everything out there. I want you to make sure that your word to Nebraska and Nebraska is the place that you want to be at the end of the day. And I wonder if that might be kind of uh, a part of this, uh, is that, you know, you just see Hall might – maybe. I know that he really likes his time at Tennessee. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know that he's got other visits going on. Um, I mean, he's visited Penn State, uh, visited Arkansas, mm-hmm. visited all around. You know, like I think it might be one of those things where if you're not fully committed to Nebraska, or if you think you want to go elsewhere, then by by all means go elsewhere. You're not obligated to go to Nebraska. Uh, I wonder if that that might be kind of a thing at play here. Nebraska's got a lot of receivers on the radar. And a lot of pretty good suitors lined up for Hall, so it might be the best thing for, for both parties in the long run. That's the, the local hand grenade, though, isn't it, Brady and, and Elijah, where the, the freak-out level goes to DEFCON 2 when you don't get a, a local kid. But if the kid's wanting an offer from Tennessee, uh, really interested in Old Miss, likes A&M, looks at Arkansas, hey, that's just, that's just kind of where things are at right now. It's not for lack of Nebraska's effort. Is that fair? Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, remember, these are high school kids. Some of them say, I've lived in Nebraska my entire life. I want to go do this or I want to go elsewhere kind of thing. You know, I think at, at, at some point in all of our lives, I know at least for me personally, I was like, I want to experience something outside of Nebraska, you know, at least for a little bit. And then on the flip side, you've got the actual like active recruiting. So you've got SEC powerhouses. You've got teams on the upward trend recruiting at you and coming at you. And then for Nebraska, you know, you're getting the getting the big in-state guys is big. But also, if you've got four stars from Texas and Florida that want to come in, what are you going to, you know, are you going to shy them away just because you know, somebody might have one foot out the door from Nebraska kind of thing? You know, sure. you want guys you want guys who are committed to Nebraska, regardless of where they grew up. It does probably hurt a little bit more at losing an in-state kid, but. If they're not going to be all in on Nebraska, like say someone from even outside the state is, you, you know, you're going to want somebody that's going to be proud to wear that that red N mm-hmm. all the time, and and that's just kind of how the cookie crumbles sometimes. Brady, do you think Matt Rule's worried about the optics if he ends up losing Davon Hall, Teddy Rezac, Carter Nelson, all within his first 12 months of, of coming to the University of Nebraska? Do you think he's at all worried about those optics? Um. I don't know. I, I tend to think not. If he wins, uh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't hurt as bad if he wins. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, he's undefeated right now. You know, how can you argue with that record? But <laughs> it's. But also keep in mind, like, when he showed up, they lost um, Ben Brommer, you know, um, out to Iowa State. Um, they, they really wanted um, Benny, you know, at Lincoln High, went to mm-hmm. Iowa State. They had Hayden Moore out in Colorado, decommitted and flipped to Michigan. Keep in mind, everybody lost their minds when Ernest Hausman uh, went into the transfer portal and went to Michigan. Plus, yeah, you got all these guys. It's And then at the same time, Ed Foley is doing his tour to Nebraska, and they're going to all these schools. I think it, you're not going to get every single recruit in the state. That's just a fact of recruiting. It's just not going to happen. I'm sure like it, it probably sours some people's feelings and, and hurts some feelings when it doesn't actually happen. But that's just the nature of the law. Um, you you want to get the guys that you want to get. Sometimes that works out. Sometimes it doesn't. But 
it's it's all it's all in a day's worth of recruiting. So they're I'm sure it might dent spirits a little bit, but you got to know that Matt Rule and his staff are going to like the guys that they come in, and if they're going to play for Nebraska, they're going to get Nebraskans to cheer for them. Brady Altman's with us, HailVarsity.com and Magazine Recruiting Outlook here. Two tight ends to talk about. Your thoughts right now, uh, Carter Nelson, and, uh, of course, you have Michael Burt now on the radar. He'll be in this weekend, uh, offered about a week ago by Iowa, really talented kid, uh, standout program at Creighton Prep. Yeah, Michael's one of those guys that I think he he's one of those recruiting cases where things get might be slow brewing at first, but when they get hot, you know, they really take off. I mean, he announced four Big Ten offers all in the same day. And they're I mean, they're they're quality offers, obviously. I mean, Iowa was one of the first ones and they have a pretty good history of putting tight ends out in, in the league. So that's gonna be one to certainly watch. Um and then Sam Sledge coming in. They have a recruiting pipeline. AJ Rollins, the staff is very high on. He's from Creighton Prep. So there is, a, even while having the new staff, there is kind of a, a pipeline to prep. And I think getting him camped in, getting that more face time, the coaching staff is really going to want to have that to build a relationship with him. And then you look at Carter, he's coming off that official visit to Georgia that he really enjoyed. He's, I believe he's got a visit else. He's got one to Notre Dame coming up and then one I want to say elsewhere. Before Penn State. His, and Penn State, that's right, uh, before his official to Nebraska. Um, I know I'd, I'd, I'd kind of said before that he he might be willing to push his commitment into the season just to see how Nebraska uses their tight ends. But now from talking um, from family talk and Ainsworth talk, it sounds like he's he's only going to do that if he doesn't have a strong feeling of what he wants to do by the end of his Nebraska visit. Uh, he 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 would prefer to get the commitment done before the season gets going and and have that decision kind of tucked away. But um, so if he knows where he wants to go right after his Nebraska commitment, he's going to do that. But if it's still up in the air at that point, they'll push it out a little bit more. Real quick. Do you think Georgia wowed him? I think they did. And I think they it's 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 normal to do that. You know, I mean, it's it's tough to go into two time defending national champion and not get wowed. But at the same time, Notre Dame and Nebraska both have their kind of separate cases. So, um, you know, the. It, one one legitimate case is good, but the rest of the week or the rest of the month is going to be uh, equally impressive on different planes. Brady will keep locked in on HailVarsity.com for your updates and Twitter as well, at Brady Oltman's follow him. And uh, we may uh, cheers a beer here this weekend if we get out of baseball, <laughs> at baseball all weekend. But uh, thanks for making time. That's a sweet jersey. And we'll see the wardrobe next Friday, all right? Appreciate you guys. Go Tigers. There yeah. he is. Look at Brady Altman. That's not a Missouri, I'd say. <laughs> uh, Daddy Burke, Vison Sports Network on the way. And now. And now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. Hale Varsity Radio, presented by Currency. Christian Elijah Herbal. Big thanks to Brady Altman and uh, Bill Dolman this hour as we turn our attention and let's talk some gambling, Visa and Sports Network. Danny Burke with us at Danny Burke 5, the Danny Burke Podcast. Pride of Chicago, good to talk to you again. It's been a while. How are we doing? Doing good, Smitty. You know, I know Elijah's feeling pretty solid back there. His nuggets are looking prime. Uh, we're feeling solid about our series bets. So uh, looking forward to game four tonight. Can't complain. No, game four will be a, a ton of fun. And, and I owe potentially multiple steaks and beer to... What Elijah Herbal? Well, I think you owe me a ribeye. Connor owes me a fillet. You guys each owe me a beer. You're gonna make him shake, shake out for a fillet, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, well played. And he was he was telling me how some of his other student side gigs from the school yourself haven't paid him, and I'm like, well, I better get paying you because you're gonna have to be paying me. <laughs> and you're like, it ain't my problem, Daddy. What's been successful, uh, even lucrative here when you look at this NBA Finals? What's what's something you've honed in on and really liked action-wise, either props or quarters or in-game? What's, what's kind of been something you've been researching and, and really paying attention to? Yeah, aside from, well, really the only thing I've bet for this final had been those pre-flop series that, or rather, not only even that, but it's just been sweating out the Nuggets' futures because obviously Denver came into this series as a sizable favorite, and 
you know, they were big favorite games one and two. He pulled through in game two. But looking at it, considering that the numbers are priced pretty accordingly at this point in the series, I think you just got to look at if you have it available to you. I know some jurisdictions don't, but these in-game player props. And I know I've talked about this with you guys before. I think Elijah and I were speaking on this last week. But, again, a lot of these algorithms, when they do these live numbers, don't adjust accordingly a lot of the time. Like, you know, they don't really factor in when these players are inevitably going to be sitting down for their due rotations. Like, Jokic could have kind of a slow start, and, you know, then the numbers start to creep down, and then you know he's going to go on the bench toward the end of the first quarter, and then they go down even more. But you know that he's going to figure it out. You know that the numbers are going to adjust too much. He's going to come back into the game in just his normal schedule, and then you can really hone in on taking advantage of some of those altered numbers. So, Jokic, maybe not as much in this series because he's been an absolute menace, and you know you kind of factor in how dominant he's going to be. But other players who are getting a better look at that, and even not necessarily looking to attack their overs, but looking at some of these Miami guys to their unders, like Jimmy Butler has had some starts where he hasn't looked too strong and not being as aggressive to the rim. And, you know, Gabe Vincent, the guy who's come alive, you know, he may slow down from time to time. Or when Max Struess went off in game two, you you figured he wasn't going to be shooting pretty much 100% from the floor. So really what that market is giving you the opportunity to do is to jump in on something that gets a tad bit inflated. And if you don't feel too comfortable with the spread or the total free flop, again, it's a game of runs. It's incredibly volatile. And that's when you can jump in if you're watching it really closely and intently and try to pick a spot to where you can understand what the tempo of the game is going to turn out to be and then attack it from that perspective. So that's something that I'm scouting out even more so now that, again, these numbers have marinated to where they really should be. But, hey, even though the Nuggets are more of a big, or what, they're about like three and a half, I mean, it's a narrow it's a narrow spread there. So if the Heat go up quickly, maybe it's like, I don't know, 10-4 or something like that in the first quarter, even if you want to let it wait a little bit, I think you're going to get a great opportunity to get a better price on the Nuggets in terms of the side if you don't have those props available to you. Because Miami, obviously, you know, needing to win this game is potentially uh, their last home game effort here. They're going to need to go absolutely all out from the start. They can't keep playing from behind. So there's going to be a good chance to get that with Denver early on, which is probably what I'm going to be scouting out to do. Danny Burks with us here. It's Burks Best Bets. And Danny, does that three number scare you as of right now? Is that, is that why you're waiting or are you just not have enough confidence in it? It's not necessarily anything about being like fearful with it. It's just kind of understanding I'm going to get a better number. And typically okay. when I'm betting the NBA, I prefer this all the time, but just because of all the shenanigans that happen at the end of games, whether it's random chuck ups at the buzzer, all the late game following, all of that kind of nonsense, I would rather just be sitting on a money line, even if I got to pay a little bit more for that. So with the number at about three and a half, they're certainly charging you a decent tax on the money line. So, again, assuming even early on, if Miami gets up by a little, I'll get a cheap in price on the Nuggets, I'll completely be comfortable with just jumping in then. And, look, if you're fine with laying the price free flop, you don't want to wait, I still think you'll be okay. I still think Denver has plenty of the advantages, and they'll be able to cover that. But, yeah, I kind of like the idea of getting three or lower if I had to do the spread. And then money line, I'd probably look to attack if you get it about minus buck 50 or cheaper than that. It's Again, nothing that is anything that I'm, you know, having trepidation toward in terms of not thinking they can cover it. It's just being a little greedy, having patience, knowing that more often than not, I'm going to get a better number with them. Let's talk Stanley Cup final. You have game four Saturday, Golden Knights, Panthers. Panthers got up off the mat. Uh, Golden Knights have been spectacular. And uh, really, uh, some of the officiatings, I'm not knocking it, but they've not let Florida irritate uh, as much as they've irritated this postseason. Uh, does, uh, does Florida get even, uh, or does, do, do the Knights take control here? I lean toward the latter. I mean, I got a couple of series bets on the Knights. Uh, took them pre-flop series in terms of the outright win at about minus 125. Then for them to cover the series spread at a decent plus price, so I need them to cover one and a half games, meaning they got to win in five or six at this point. It's not appalling to think that Florida pulled that out in game three. I mean, down 2-0, backs against the wall, that's the game you need to win, and that's typically when you see teams in that situation come alive. And with that being said, I mean, Vegas still outplayed them just by the eye test, and 
just looking at these numbers, a lot of these analytics in these sites that dish out the metrics, I mean, Vegas controlled about 63% of the expected shots and, you know, expected goals for Vegas had the advantages there. Uh, again, for the third game in a row, they scored two power play goals. I think they had maybe six opportunities in game three. Florida has yet to capitalize on a power play, and that's a testament to the penalty kill of the Golden Knights, and more so even Aiden Hill, who's been an absolute stud. I, I get that it wasn't ideal how it went down toward the end of game three, but they pulled Bobrovsky a little bit earlier than they thought. Uh, Vegas's defense at that point looked very weary, just kind of playing a defensive minded game toward the end of the third, and then Aiden Hill wasn't necessarily set up for success, and you kind of just had the feeling that after Vegas did not capitalize on that power play going into OT, that Florida was going to squeak it out, which they did. But, again, guys, I mean, look, Florida, yeah, Bobrovsky finally played a good game. They may have a little bit of momentum. Vegas is still the better team. The metrics are showing that they've really controlled, for the most part, all three of these games. I think because of the price, because Vegas, in my mind, is still the better team, that if you get them on the money line about plus 105 or better, which it may get better than that the closer we get to puck drop, I think Vegas is worth a play. Or if you even think that's the case, too, at that point, you, you know Vegas going back to game five and Sin City are going to be even a bigger favorite. <laughs> you could just bet this series to end in five games at about plus 260 is what I was seeing. So if you think Vegas does win for game four, and they do, all right, then you got that ticket. You could hedge if you really want to on Florida at that underdog price for game five to at least get your money back. But, yeah, I like Vegas for this next game. I think they close this thing out in five. Aiden Hill's been a stud, like I said. And, again, just the overall personnel for Vegas. They have too many weapons. They're very disciplined. The power play's been huge. And I think that's going to be profitable from a betting perspective and obviously successful from them winning kind of side of things. Danny, thanks for the time, brother. Always appreciate it. Hey, you back, guys. Enjoy your week. Take care. And now. And now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. One final time. Reminder, weekend edition tomorrow, 7... Can we just say 745 <laughs> instead of 730? No, 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 no. You undersell and over-deliver. So we'll say 8 and we'll be on the air at 745. No, we'll, 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 <laughs> we'll aim for 730-ish, and you can watch... And to hear that, the Hale Varsity YouTube channel, Hale Varsity Radio Twitter feed for the weekend edition. Uh, myself, Mark Cranach, Elijah Herbal. So we'll get that rolling. And uh, good show today. Good stuff from Bill Dolman. Brady Oltman's all over recruiting. We have another commitment to tell you about, and that's Tyson Terry, the O North lineman committing to Nebraska. Pledge number two of 2025. Brady has. Uh, Plenty of info on that, uh, Brady Altman's with Hale Varsity. So log on, HaleVarsity.com. Get your subscription. I know the yearbook's uh, on its way to your mailbox, but if it isn't, get to a newsstand, get to an outlet, log on, HaleVarsity.com. Get the yearbook ordered. Get your subscription. Get the digital for all the updates for you. Uh, can get the show, Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, for the audio part of the podcast, full show, or the interviews you want to hear, Jacob Padilla in Hour 1. And then, of course, Danny Burke with the NBA and NHL postseason. Thoughts on the wagering angle from Vizen Sports Network. Okay, Elijah, three seems dangerous. That's a low, low number and probably too low, but you'd have to think... Miami and points at home? That just screams to me Denver's going to win, doesn't it? My heart tells me the Nuggets win this one. My head tells me to bet the Heat. Okay. So are you betting Miami? I, I, I fundamentally disagree with emotional hedge bets. So <laughs> I'll let you pick and I'll go the other way. I don't want to pick. I'm better off. <laughs> I'm, I'm undefeated when you pick. Should we bet the uh, how many total points, rebounds, and assists Nikola Jokic has? No, because that's, I mean, it's going to be 30, 20, and 12. Yeah, well, this line's set at 53 and a half, so you can take the over. Eh, man. I'm not going to bet the under. Are you kidding me? I, I, I will. Do you want me to take Denver in the three? Nah, I should really take Denver in the three. Okay, we'll do it. Let's take it a beer. Can we buy it down to two and a half? No. <laughs> Hell no. <laughs> I will give you a sirloin as the steak option, and I'll give you four. Nothing against sirloin fans. 
Yeah, because you want you want the strip or the or the tomahawk or the ribeye, don't yeah, you? Yeah, I do. Right. You, I mean, I'll go three. Okay. Okay. I will take the heat. I'll take. Yeah, I'll take. I, I get the three. And it's steak and a beer. Virtual shake, since I can't reach through the glass on you. I'd prefer to do a money line bet, but I'll 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 settle with this. I'll I'll emotionally. I've got to take the three at home. Yeah, um, emotionally, I I couldn't go against the Nuggets. I don't think. I turned in tuned in third quarter, and it was the freaking beatdown. Yeah, I'm like man, and then Elijah sends this mooing cow. Oh. And a beer. And a beer. <laughs> oh, I'm getting fed. So check out the podcast. Appreciate you checking in. Check out your friends at Gary Michaels if you just heard that spot for the battle in Boulder. And we'll talk to you tomorrow, 7.30, weekend edition, the Hale Varsity YouTube channel. Enjoy your weekend. Thanks for tuning in. Talk to you uh, next time on Hale Varsity.